Hi, I'm Anne and welcome back to my channel. A little background on me. Growing up, I always loved the Beauty and the Beast fairy tale. No, not just like the happy, wonderful Disney one where everyone's wonderful and everything's great, but no, I meant the like darker original one. I very last minute decided to dress up for it this video, so this costume is literally a mess, but I figured it was easy and I don't have any yellow in my closet because I hate the color yellow. So now, yes, I definitely did love the Disney version, thus my costume, but there were a lot of other adaptations I absolutely loved. For example, there was one from Fairy Tale Theater in the 80s, I believe 1984, uh, with Beauty and the Beast, which stars Susan Sheridan. I think that's how, how you pronounce her name, but I will say she makes a much better villain in Enchanted than she does Beauty in Beauty and the Beast. But looking back, I see that that adaptation is not that scary at all. But when I was a child, that was terrifying to me. Just the dark colors, the fancy brocades everywhere. It was all terrifying to me. There was also this like weird musical in also the 80s. That one was weird too. But the whole point is like I'm not just obsessed with Beauty and the Beast because of the Disney version so I decided a couple weeks ago to just try to read as many Beauty and the Beast retellings as I could. Also if you hear like any weird rain sounds it's because it is pouring out. Now I had a total of like 12 picked out and I ended up getting to only seven of them so so I guess this video will be kind of comprised of mini reviews of my different thoughts on all these different Beauty and the Beast retellings. Um, I was surprised how many of these I really enjoyed and even the ones I didn't enjoy they were still like average. I didn't hate them. Uh, in fact there was none that I gave below two star which for me is really good. Also there will be kind of a slight spoiler warning going into this video. I won't be telling like all the details of the endings or things like that but I will be talking about some spoilers. I feel like I should just like put that out there in case people are like sensitive to spoilers. So let's get to the books. So the first book I read was A Beauty and the Beast by Shandahan. Chanda? I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. I ended up giving this five stars which is the highest you can give it on Goodreads. Um, it was definitely not a perfect book but I kind of fell in love with it and it reminded me a lot of one of my favorite books ever when I was a teenager which is The Trouble with Kings by Sherwood Smith. I love this book. Back to of Beauty and the Beast. So this story follows Rosalie who is a witch and she's kind of been secluded from society, especially in the country of Bast, because that specific country doesn't really allow magic, they don't like magic, and she's been raised after being orphaned by this witch who's literally called like evil. This is how it's how it's spelled. So her mother wants to seek revenge on the seven kingdoms and in doing so she forces Rosalie to marry the prince of Bast, Xander. He's kind of a, a jerk and everyone's really afraid of her. In fact, it's really funny because he doesn't like her so much that he refuses to look on her face. So at their wedding is the first day they meet and she's wearing a veil for the wedding and then he doesn't allow her to take off the veil, locks her in her room forever, but she sneaks out and meets him uh, and he thinks she's someone else. There's that dynamic of them growing to care for each other not knowing who the other person is. I mean, she finds out who he is pretty quickly, but it's definitely a humorous situation, but kind of weird. There's also the case of this wild beast that is killing random people. There's also like hints of werewolf and stuff like that, not to get into too many spoilers. But I did like the dynamics of like who is really the beast and who is the beauty. Like they're both good looking in a sense, but Rosalie is considered evil just because she has magic, because she's a witch, not necessarily because she herself is mean. Whereas Xander is kind of very cruel to her at the beginning. And he's kind of like, there's one point that he says, I, I'll never learn to love. I'm not capable of loving anyone. So it's interesting dichotomy of kind of trying to figure out who's really the beast, the one that a lot of people consider to be bad or the one who is kind of being a horrible human being. Another thing that's really interesting about this book is that Rosalie has these dreams where she sees the murders by the beast, but 
her perspective is from the beast. So she also keeps like blacking out and waking up with dirt and mud all over her dress. So she starts to believe that she's the beast. So there's that interesting stuff going on. I feel like that's not really a spoiler because you do find that out relatively early on. The only thing I didn't like about this book is that she has a bunch of sisters. Seven sisters? I don't remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she has like six sisters and she's the seventh, so there's seven total, like as in the seven kingdoms. But I also know this is the first book of the series and the others I assume are retellings of different fairy tales. I'm not sure. Um, so I know that the sisters had to be introduced now so that it would make sense to have sequels about them. I don't know, but I really didn't care at all for their like random appearances or she's like once in a while contacting them for through a mirror. That was kind of silly, but besides that, I love this book. It was great. So the next book I read is Bookish and the Beast by Ashley Poston. I feel like I am butchering all these author names. So if you are one of these authors and you are watching this video, I'm so sorry. It's based around Rosie who loves books and she's absolutely obsessed with this one book series that's called Starfield. It kind of seems to be similar to Star Wars. Then you have Vance, who actually plays the villain slash anti-hero in the movie series. So the book actually opens up three months before the main story takes place. And Rosie is at a, I'm gonna say like anime convention, but it's for this Starfield show specifically. And she runs into a guy that's dressed as General Sand, which is actually the character that Vance plays on TV. They kind of have a few hours of getting to know each other and liking each other. And, and then the night's over and she doesn't know who he is. So it's got that idea of like Cinderella, but also from both perspectives, because neither of them recognize each other. But of course, Vance is actually the guy that she met. So he was in costume, but that's also the character he plays on TV, so he kind of wasn't in cosplay? Very confusing. But flash forward three months later, it is almost her homecoming, and there's this guy, Garrett, who's kind of the world's equivalent of Gaston, who's trying to convince her to go to prom, but he's like low-key just like telling the entire school that she's going with him, even though she hasn't said yes. So he's kind of an asshole. So Rosie uh, accidentally finds this dog who is Vance's dog, and she follows it into this house that she believes is abandoned, but turns out that's where Vance and his uncle are living because Vance kind of got the tabloids after him. That's kind of a long story. I won't get into too much of the details, but she ends up going to the library, finding this like rare first edition of a Starfield book. And she like picks it up and then she accidentally falls into their outdoor pool when Vance like comes up on her. He doesn't really sneak up on her, but anyway. So she agrees to organize their library or the library that they're staying in, in return for like not having to pay the cost for the first edition book because it's worth several thousand dollars. So in that, the uncle is trying to force Vance to help her organize. So they're supposed to organize it together and there's romance and humor. I wasn't a huge fan of this book. I didn't really like the characters. Rosie has this very hashtag not like other girls type vibe. She's like so relatable and like quirky. She just felt like that girl that's supposed to be relatable, but she's kind of pretty boring. Vance was interesting in the beginning and I especially liked his character growth because he's kind of a jerk in the beginning. He's very full of himself, but he's not happy. And it is interesting how like he goes from purely playing video games to she kind of introduced him to the world of books and gets him reading. I feel like his change in character feels a bit sudden. Uh, like one moment he's kind of a jerk and then suddenly he's not. Now what I did like is this book is organized into four parts. A villain, rebel, friend, and hero. So it goes from obviously the villain, like he's the bad guy, to being a rebel. He's still kind of um, not very nice to friend, grow a relationship, not necessarily romantic, but kind of friendship. And then hero where of course 
he ends up with the girl. Spoilers, but I feel like if you know the tale of Beauty and the Beast, you know how it's gonna end. Uh, for the record, also, all of these have happy endings. There's also a lot of references in this book to other books. Like there's one of How's Moving Castle, one of Pride and Prejudice. There were so many. I, I took note of like a couple, but then I honestly gave up because there were so many. So, But I also didn't really like any of the characters. So I ended up giving this two stars, which means the book was okay, but that I didn't really like it. So the next book is The Beast's Heart by, I feel like I'm going to butcher this pronunciation so bad, uh, Lief Shalcross. So this book is kind of the complete opposite of the previous book. It's not set in the modern day. It is set in 17th century France. It is probably the most similar to the original fairy tale. The flowery writing threw me off. I am someone who doesn't write like extremely flowery writing. There are some people who do and they would probably enjoy this book more, but I do not. I'm just going to read you like a little bit of the writing just so you can get kind of a grasp of how flowery it is. Enchantments and dreams. I suspect they are made of the same stuff. Each beguile the mind and confuse the senses with wonder and strangeness. So all that was familiar becomes freakish and the most bizarre of things intimate and natural. For the longest time after the curse fell, I did not know if I was a beast who dreamed of being a man or a man who dreamed he was a beast. So it's like this very flowery language, which I don't mind, but it did feel like a bit much. There's not much substance in this book and I felt like a lot of it was added on padding to just make the book longer, which I didn't really enjoy. So obviously from that short excerpt I read, this is told from the perspective of the beast, which I thought was interesting. But the problem with that is I really loved the character of the beast. I could feel his loneliness. It, it really plays up the theme of loneliness and sadness and seeking out happiness and being kept away from the world, which is very reminiscent of what is currently going on in modern day because a lot of us are stuck at home because of COVID. However, I did have a lot of criticisms of this book too because it's told in the beast's perspective. I never felt like I got to know Iza at all. She was just kind of perfect very very good which fits with the regular like original fairy tale but i was hoping for more especially in a full book because if you're gonna tell a fairy tale that's like 10 pages long it's not like you can spend much time developing characters but if you have a 300 page book I want a little bit of character. Also, a lot of time is spent with her sister. So in the original fairy tale, I think she had two brothers and two sisters, I'm pretty sure. Um, but in this retelling, she only has the two sisters, Marie and Claude, and pretty much, I would say, at least a third of the book, if not more, was told in the beast having dreams of what was going on with Isla's family. So we would spend so much time on Marie finding a guy and marrying him and Claude finding romance and marrying him and them struggling without their sister. And they're not horrible human beings like they were in the original, but they're, they were still kind of like used to Belle taking over. So they have to like kind of take over. I did not care at all about their characters. And since the book spent a third of the time on them, I felt like it was just padding and I really, <laughs> disliked it. So I ended up giving this book three stars. I didn't like dislike it, but because of so much of the filler, whether it's the flowery language or the stuff with the sisters, I just found really decreased my liking of the book, even though I loved how it stuck with all these details of the original, but from Beast perspective. The next one is Beauty and the Clockwork Beast by Nancy Campbell Allen. So this is a book that partially prompted this challenge for me because I've been wanting to read this book for a while. I've seen it on so many different blogs and I love steampunk books and it's kind of combining my two favorite things, which is like fairy tale retellings with steampunk. And I'm like, sign me up. I had mixed feelings about this book. I did like it generally, but there were a lot of like weaknesses. Lucy Pickett is the main character and she comes to visit her cousin Kate uh, after receiving a letter saying, there are mysterious happenings going on in my new house. Now her cousin Kate recently married this guy, Jonathan, and Jonathan's brother is Miles Blackwell, and he is the owner of this big massive estate in England. And he's also the beast 
character. He's kind of very intimidating. People don't really like him. He's mysterious. And his wife and sister died a few months ago, I think six months before this story takes place, under mysterious circumstances. Now, Lucy works for the Botanical Aid Society. So not only is she really into plants, the society also works to deal with vampires and shapeshifters, which are a big part of this world. It's a really interesting world, but I thought the steampunk elements were kind of back round to the more fanciful elements. So there are like automaton, which they call like tons, which I thought was funny. Uh, but for the most part, there's mostly like magic and shapeshifters and vampires. And that's kind of the focus around the estate that Lucy goes to. There are strange attackings of vampires as well as, and this is like a slight spoiler alert, but I feel like you learn it relatively soon in the book. So it's not that much of a spoiler, but Miles is actually a shapeshifter and he shapes into a wolf. Now, it's not really mentioned in the book, but this is what I assume because they mention like predatory shapeshifters are uh, slightly different than like non-predatory. So for example, a wolf would definitely be predatory. Lucy mentions that she had an uncle who was a fox, but I assume that you can also have shapeshifters who are say a rabbit, which is not very like intimidating, but it's not mentioned in the book. So this is just my supposition because they don't really go into this unless I missed it. I thought that was like an interesting concept. It's not like purely like vampires and werewolves. It's like vampires and shifters and you can have them shift into like multiple different animals. Now the book is told in Lucy and Miles perspective. I honestly didn't really like his perspective all that much. Uh, but I also felt like I didn't like his character all that much because he felt like this like angsty, mysterious guy that didn't really have that much character outside of his angst. Uh, Lucy, I really enjoyed, but I did feel at times she was a contradiction because she was introduced as this like strong, independent woman. She travels a lot. She has this very demanding job, but then also she just like, is weak randomly to kind of be saved by Miles, which like if you want to create either of those characters, I have no problem. Like I think you can make weaker physical women that have strengths in other ways, or you can make these like very strong, powerful women. You know, it, it's up to you. Like depending on how you do it, you can do either well. But I just thought that her character was too much of a contradiction because they wanted to make her into like the regular damsel in distress you see in a lot of romance books. But then they also wanted to make her like a strong, modern, independent woman. And it just didn't fit together that well. But the mystery aspects of like what's going on with the ha hauntings in the house, um, because that's why Kate invited Lucy to the house, because there's strange hauntings. And um, the sister of Miles keeps appearing to Lucy, which again, I feel like that's not a spoiler because we find that out early on. But also like who's attacking and killing the people around the estate, the, you know, vampire, who's the vampire. So there's a lot of like questions about what's going on. And I really love the mystery aspect, but I just did not like the romance so much. Probably because I didn't like the main characters all that much. Um, I liked them when they were solving the mystery, but not outside that. I ended up giving this book three stars. So for me, it was good, but it wasn't anything that stood out to me as being great. So the next one is Beauty and the Beast by Vivian Savage. I had really mixed feelings about it, but I love the concept. So the main characters are Anastasia, Rose, and um, Alistair, and he is actually a dragon shifter, a dragon shape shifter. So his family, which is kind of Scottish and he wears kilts as a human, which kind of threw me off as being like weird, but I also like realized the author might be going with the idea of the fighting between Scotland and England for a lot of its history. So pretty much what happened was Alistair's parents, his mother was a witch, his father was also a shapeshifter like him. They were murdered kind of they were killed in battle. So Alistair tries to seek revenge for his dead parents and he kind of gets carried away killing a bunch of like innocent people. So there is this fairy called Eos who curses him to 
remain a dragon in his dragon form. So he can't transform back into his human form for 13 years until he can learn to love. I guess, because obviously he had only revenge in his heart, uh, which I think the idea, the concept is really cool. I love the idea of Beast being a dragon because one, I love dragons. And two, it's interesting to have him able, like even before he's transformed purely into dragon, to be able to like shift back and forth from dragon to human. That's a very interesting idea. Anastasia Anna as well when she's introduced I found her very interesting she's kind of a little bit rebellious she wants to go to school for magic I liked the idea of like her trying to get better with her magic the problem I had is her magic is ignored for like 90% of the book and the only time it's not is for a plot point so here's the thing in the beginning the magic is kind of vague. I assume it's some sort of Latin because she says these spells and then the magic happens. But it's introduced in the beginning when she's at Alistair's castle, which I'll get to in a minute. She practices a little bit because she finds like a meditation rock circle thing that Alistair has near his house. And then in the end, she kind of just suddenly has all this magic and takes on the bad guy with her magic. And I was like, that's unexpected. So I really disliked how they wove her having magic into the story because I feel like it was ignored like 90% of the book and then just came in when important plot points. And it made no sense because all the tension that was built up with like, will she, won't she succeed with her magic is like downplayed as pointless. So like the main fight at the end, I found very anticlimactic. Before that, in the beginning, the way she gets to his castle is her father decides randomly to marry her off to this guy, Edward, who then tries to rape her the day before their wedding. So she stabs him, runs away from the palace. And when she gets back to her home, uh, her father is being attacked by the dragon. Uh, and the reason the Alistair the dragon is attacking them is because Anna's father keeps sending men to get these magical roses that have healing properties to save his dying wife. So Anna's mother is really sick. But also there's this idea of getting a dragon's blood makes you immortal. So if you drink the dragon's blood, so I'm not sure what was that going on with that that was just weird. So I wasn't sure what her father really wanted, which her father was the biggest criticism I have in the book. And I'll get to that in a minute. But so Alistair is attacking and he pretty much says to Anna's father that you have to come live in my kingdom and live in my castle and be my prisoner. Uh, and of course, Anna's like, no, take me instead. And so he does. And so that's how they end up living together. And then what does her father do? He goes to Edward, the guy who almost raped his daughter, but he doesn't know that. And Edward claims that Anna lost her mind and tried to kill him without provocation, by the way. And like the father just believes this and he's like, oh, but I really need to save my daughter from this beast. If you like take out the beast, you can have her. I'm like, that makes no sense. <laughs> like, so the dad on one hand claims he loves his daughter and then he just sells her off to the first guy that comes asking for her hand even though she expressly asks him not to and then when his daughter's like taken by a dragon he goes and makes a pack with a guy that she ran away from and tried to stab he doesn't know why but he just like believes the random prince over like his beloved daughter and then He's willing to just exchange his daughter, switch having his daughter live with a dragon to live with a random prince. I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. If you want to rescue your daughter, why don't you rescue her? Why would you like just sell her off? Like, I don't, I don't understand any of this man's thoughts. Her father was such a confusing character. Anyway, the book is told from the perspectives of Alistair and Anna. And there's also these like weird romance dreams that they have throughout the book where they actually, at first they both think it's just dreams because they'll meet each other. Um, Anna will meet like the human version of Alistair and then they'll kind of get to know each other somewhat in the dreams while they're also getting to know each other as like 
human and dragon in the real life but the dreams get really awkward as they continue like there's a lot of like <clears throat> kissing and other stuff i don't like a lot of the more erotic elements of romance i don't care about that i skip over scenes like that but when it's in a dream and you don't know if it's true or not until later it's just like awkward to read i just oh it's just like creepy i don't i don't want to think about it the book was okay but i didn't i really didn't like any of the characters that much alistair is kind of like a blank slate not really fully developed um anna was interesting but they ignored her magic for most of the book which i really didn't like and her father was such a confusing character i ended up giving it two stars so the next book is probably the shortest because it's only a novella it's not a book unlike all of these and that is beauty and the baron by joanna barker so it follows this girl rose sinclair whose father got into gambling he owned a bookstore that she actually managed the i guess bookkeeping for so she kept track of all the sales and money and things like that her father ends up secretly taking out a bunch of loans around town including from this powerful guy that's kind of known as a beast henry covington and he ends up getting super into debt because he gambles and she finds out and they have to close his business he's thrown into debtor's prison and she is able to sell all the books and the bookstore and pay off all his other debts except she doesn't have enough money to pay off henry covington so she goes to this guy who's kind of considered a like jerk but the problem is like we never see him be a jerk we're just like told he is and every time we see him he's like really nice so it doesn't really make all that much sense anyway but she goes to him and she asks well i will do your bookkeeping for free if um like you forgive my father's debt of course he says i'm not gonna let you near my books like your father was a crazy gambler but you can be my maid and like he has a, he at first is like no you don't get a job here and then he's like well we do need a maid so she starts working there and of course like they fall in love now again like a lot of these books it is told from rose's perspective and henry's perspective the the book feels really underdeveloped to me like it goes from the beginning of them meeting and i thought okay this will be intriguing i liked kind of both their characters even if i didn't think he was a beast at all and i didn't know why he got that reputation because he seemed like a really good guy but then it went like a month later and he's like you changed my life i love you so much i'm like wait what how, how do we go from that so there didn't really felt feel like much of a development in their relationship they only had a handful of scenes together which i get it this book is only about 100 pages so i understand it's not like you can do a lot in developing relationship over just 100 pages but it was also sweet and short and i liked both of their characters basically i just wanted to see more of a development in the romance instead of like from point a to c without much b in there so I ended up giving this three stars so average to me but not like anything amazing and finally we are moving on to the last book oh my gosh i don't know how like short i'll be editing this video down but so far it is at like 46 minutes so i'm hoping to get it down to a half hour but this video may be a lot longer than my usual ones so the last book is of beast and beauty by Stacey J. This is definitely the one book that I thought had the most incredible world. I love this world. They have a prologue in the beginning that introduces there was this god in this world and it was divided into the pure heart and the dark heart and the smooth skins as they're called because they have literally smooth skin. They make a pact with the dark heart to make their city fruitful and powerful if they'll like sacrifice humans to the dark heart once in a while <laughs> in return they'll be protected they'll have this massive like dome over the city that protects them from all outside but they're also kind of cursed by making that deal uh that some of their kind turn into what is called banished and these people have monstrous traits so the monstrous are all the things outside the city they have scales and they're considered to be monsters i guess to the people and the banished in the city are kind of forced into one area uh, away from like the high society so that's the world in which our story starts our main character is princess isra isra 
I think Isra. I like Isra better. I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. And she is the princess of Yuan, which is this city. Um, also, a weird thing, I've noticed a lot of like Chinese names in this book, which is weird. Like maybe I'm reading into it too much, but for example, the advisor to her father is Junjie, which very Chinese name, and his son is Bo, which is again, Chinese. And then her last name of the like ruling class of family is Yu Ji Hua. So again, like the city's name is Yuan, which I take it to be like this Chinese character, which uh, literally means like far away. <laughs> that's what I'm assuming, because I thought that's kind of fitting with this story. I don't actually know if that's what the author was going for. And I may be reading into this way too much, but I didn't really understand like why there were so many like really Chinese names in the book. So Isra, this princess, was blinded when she was like four years old in this horrible fire where her mother died. Now the tradition in this city is that the wives and the queens sacrifice themselves and murder themselves uh, in order to feed the dark heart and keep the city alive. In the book, it's described as the teeth of the dark heart is this rose garden. So these fancy, pretty roses, thus the tie-in with like Beauty and the Beast. And the roses will eat up the blood of the sacrificed and then take it down to the dark heart, which is below the city, kind of. That's, that's how I pictured it. Isra has been blind since she was four years old. She's now 17. Isra also believes she is part monstrous or she's one of the banished because her skin is like super like scratchy. So she believes that she has like part scales and she's turning into monster. So she kind of like hates herself, looks down on herself. Um, and then she meets Jem randomly in the Rose Garden. <laughs> she will sometimes go to the Rose Garden and like prick herself and let the roses eat a little bit of her blood. Then they will give her like visions and let her see certain views of things that are going on in the present. So Jem is one of the monstrous and he has snuck into the city with a few of his other family members to steal some of the roses, which they outside the city believe are actually where the power comes from, not necessarily like a conduit to the power, I guess, which is how I, I would see it. But there's a lot of like misconceptions, like Isra believes that the monstrous can't speak and they're animalistic. And Jem believes all these horrible things about the smooth skins. There's a lot of like misconceptions and this idea that like those that are different from you are the real monsters and you kind of like learn to believe that. But so Jem breaks into the garden and he ends up getting caught by Isra. The guards come and he's thrown into prison. And then he is her prisoner for a while. And there, there's a lot that goes on, but kind of mainly they fall in love. There's a lot of things that are revealed. I'm not going to get into too many spoilers, but I feel like I'm gonna struggle. Um, I really love the world. I've said that before. The world is definitely darker than any other adaptation I've read ever of Beauty and the Beast. So I really enjoyed how like the author was willing to go dark because a lot of the Beauty and the Beast retellings are pretty light and happy. And this one is not. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of grim stuff. So the romance was just like, Meh. Like Jem and Isra themselves were really great characters. I loved them alone, but again, their romance just felt like they went from physical to her attraction to like, oh, I love this person. This is the amazing person. And I didn't feel like there was that jump at all. Also, the ending felt really rushed to me. So like Bo, who is the kind of the second love interest to Isra, he is the son of the advisor and he ends up like marrying Isra and then dying. I, I, again, I feel like that's a big spoiler. Oops. But um, the like main villain that's kind of trying to keep tradition alive, whereas Isra's trying to like break this curse on the city and destroy the dark heart, uh, is the advisor to her father. Her father dies in the beginning of the book and it's claimed to be a uh, Jem's family. Turns out it's not, but spoiler, I won't say anymore. And Junjia is the advisor that not only works for her father in the beginning, but then later kind of takes control over her. Except we don't actually learn what happens to him. 
like he he I feel like obviously the dark heart is kind of the main villain in the book but Junjia is the real human villain uh but we don't know whatever happens to him Bo's death is like super sudden not really developed so in the end this is like big spoiler 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 <laughs> as long as my hands are up it's a spoiler and uh, the city falls apart and in order for the dark heart to be destroyed and the peace to come back to the world the city has to fall and everyone kind of returns to the desert but the desert kind of like grows because there's a massive desert where the monstrous lived outside the city so the ending was really rushed i didn't really like it that that much but i really love the world so yeah i ended up giving this three stars and the ending i thought it was just perfect so i wanted to read you like the like last second to last paragraph isra and Jem marry and they were celebrated and named Beauty and Beast. But none of the king or queen's people would ever say which star was which. They would only look kindly on the stranger who asked and say, Beauty is wherever you find it, and Beast is there when you need to defend it. I ended up giving this three stars, but I feel like it's more like three and a half stars. I'd love to do more of these challenges again in the future, not necessarily for like Beauty and the Beast retellings, but for just retellings in general. This video is going to be very long. <laughs> Don't expect like super long videos like this every week because this took me a lot to prepare for. It really helps to grow my channel if you like and you also leave a comment down below. I'd love to see if you've not only read these books, but if you have another retelling that I didn't read here that you're like, oh, you really have to read this one. I am always looking for new retellings. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell notification to be notified of when I post next. I post every Saturday at 6 p.m. Have a great week and happy belated Thanksgiving, I guess, for those of you who are in America. If you've made it to this point, thank you so much for sitting through this entire video, and I will see you in the next one. Have a great week. Bye.